This section is going to get into money, how much money you should be making based off a role and experience and the resources you can use to figure that out. It first starts with leveling. Consider that most every company has different names for different levels. So what I'm trying to represent here is a very generic leveling structure. It works much like a pyramid, but with two main parts. On the far left side, we have our technical track, known as individual contributors. These are people that don't have other people reporting to them, typically. And on the far right, we have our management track, where their whole purpose is to have people report into them. At the very bottom of this pyramid, we have the associate level or junior level developer. This is an entry level position, somebody right out of college with their first programming job. They're the ones that are going to be making the least amount of money. Right above them, we're going to have just our regular developer. This is somebody typically with three to five years experience. Above that, we get into the senior developer roles. This will be somebody with five to seven, maybe eight years of experience. Their role is going to have a little bit more responsibility than a regular developer. They, in fact, may serve a role like tech lead. Above them, we're going to have a lead developer. And a lead developer is going to be responsible for things like code reviews and, in some cases, even managing other senior developers from a technical perspective. It's at this level we also start to see the job title of architect, somebody who's less focused on coding and more focused on the overall system. At this level two, we'll see the first level manager. We put them all on this same level because they're all going to make the same amount of money. In companies with actual leveling systems, they'll all be the same level. For example, of an associate developer were one, a developer two, senior developer three, and lead developer level four, lead developer, architect, and manager would all likely be on level four. It's also worth noting that at some companies, this is where the individual contributor track ends. And my meaning for that is that there's nowhere else for that lead developer or architect to go from an individual contributor standpoint. They're left with the only option being to move over into management, sometimes making a parallel transition to manager so they can move up into the senior manager style positions. It's above this level where some companies continue to have individual contributor tracks. They're going to have titles like principal developer or lead or senior architect, and they're going to be equivalent to somebody who's above the regular manager position, sometimes called a senior manager. This is also where at some companies, the individual contributor track will end. This may in fact be the highest you can go at that company as an individual contributor. When looking at technology companies, they will typically have ranks above that. For example, where above a senior manager, you'll have somebody who's likely a director of some sort who manages other senior directors. At some companies, you'll get into what we call the staff engineering type positions. There'll be a staff architect or a staff developer, but they'll be equivalent to a director in terms of leveling. Beyond that, at some companies, and this is more rare, you'll get into fellow style positions. This represents the highest level technical track you can be as an individual contributor, and the titles will generally contain the word fellow in them. This is generally equivalent to a general director, or in some cases at smaller companies, an AVP or vice president of some sort. The reason this is worth noting, because it's the leveling and the money that ultimately has a lot of people in the software development space end up moving into the management space, because there's only a fixed amount of money they can eventually make. Consider that the salary and total package value alone isn't enough to really determine how much money you're making. You really have to look at your location and the actual cost of living. This is because, for example, your salary in Texas is worth half as much in California. That's because it's twice as expensive on average to live in parts of California than it is Texas. That's why when trying to calculate how much you're actually earning, you have to take into account your location. And that's why I put up the average salary you need to afford a home on the left and then the composite cost of living index on the right. The whole purpose of this is showing that your money is typically going to be worth more in the lower index states because of the cost of living and the average cost it takes to buy a home. That also means you're going to just need to make more money in some of these other states to maintain a similar cost of living. The location itself can even be more meaningful. When we start looking at the extreme ends of the market, and I put up some statistics on 
San Francisco, specifically the Bay Area, you can see that the average home price here is $1.4 million. That is going to be outside of the range of almost every position you're going to find. It's important to note though, especially for people right out of college or starting out, that that $180,000 salary may look like a great deal compared to what you're getting in another state, but consider that's nothing. With that salary, you're not going to be able to afford in a lot of cases even the average monthly rent. Another critical aspect is the perk of remote, hybrid, or on-site. COVID and the pandemic has changed the way IT works and business works, but mostly IT. It has forced a lot of these IT companies to go to a remote model just to be able to function. The reality is, especially for those of us that have worked in 24-7 or global capacities, we were already there. I already had to be able to talk to someone at 7 o'clock in the, in the evening in another country because that was just the nature of my job. I wasn't intending on having to be at work 14 or 16 hours a day, so I had to take that work home with me. That's why a lot of the technology companies were really easily able to flex into being able to do remote. The result, though, is that a lot of people have realized that their jobs are just simply easier being fully remote or hybrid. So the result is that most technology jobs now are going to be hybrid. Figuring out the total compensation you should be earning can be very confusing. Prior to the internet, you had to talk to close friends to try to figure out who was making what. It was a guessing game. But with the internet, you have everyone posting their salaries anonymously everywhere. If anything, it can be too much information. A good example of this is the way that Glassdoor keeps track of salaries is very different than Levels.FYI, which is also different than Indeed. So you have to really understand how a particular site is tracking salary. Some of the sites like Glassdoor, for example, are looking at individual job titles. So if you look at a software developer, they're going to earn 63 to 146. But if you type in senior software developer, it's going to be a much different range, 97 to 225. It's also worth noting that it's typically understood that salaries fall into a bell curve, but this cannot always be true. This is just an easy way to represent the concept that if you're inside of some sort of earning band, you're going to fall into a normal distribution, but this is again not entirely scientifically accurate. When it comes to how much you should be earning, it's going to be very company specific. The reality is that some companies just don't keep their salaries competitive. So that's why it's really important to understand, for example, how much you're going to earn at company A versus company B. Your level of experience is also going to greatly determine how much you're going to be able to earn, plus your location. Some places, for example, will pay an entirely different salary in New York versus Texas. So it's also important to understand how the location impacts the underlying package value. Back to the individual roles, it's important to understand that each one of these roles you see on this series of diagram can earn a different salary. The money you're going to get for a developer or senior developer can be different than, for example, an enterprise architect. This is also not entirely representative of all the roles. There are many roles outside of this, and a lot of this has to do with there's no standard structure for what even the job titles are. You can have places using confusing titles like Senior Consulting Systems Developer 26, and other places that will just call the role Software Developer 4. But is that for the lowest on the list, or is it the highest? So you really have to start trying to map back to the fact that we have software developers who specialize in front end and back end and security and DevOps and trying to figure out how those job titles align with what the industry is choosing to call them, noting that the industry may in fact call these different roles different names. When it comes to doing research, you have a lot of options. And I'm first going to start with the site Glassdoors. It's going to collect people posting anonymous salaries based off of different roles, but consider that since roles could be called different things, an enterprise architect, for example, can mean something different at different companies, this is still just a best guess. Levels.fyi is another site. It gets more specific in terms of the individual job roles and relies on matching actual companies and the job levels to the given salary. For example, if you just were to look up software engineer salaries, it'll give you some examples, for example, JP Morgan to USAA, and it will try to stack Software Engineer 3 next to Analyst and next to Associate Software Engineer, and allows you to actually drill into them to see what the average reported salaries are for these positions at these companies. 
This can be useful when doing a general job search when you've narrowed down a company because it may be possible to look up that company and what those levels are to see where your offer fits into this information. However, you typically will find that only larger companies are going to actually have their salaries posted at this level here. At the end of the day, you're going to get what you get in an offer and you're going to have to choose whether to counter that or to just accept it. You can use some of this information though to try to navigate those waters. Another site in which you can get general salary information on is Indeed, which is a job search site. This will give you an average base salary, but also split things into other types of benefits, for example, cash bonuses and non-cash benefits like 401k. It also can be very job specific. So for example, software engineer is going to have a different result than software developer, which is going to have a different result than senior software developer. So you really have to navigate this in terms of looking at the overall range. At the end of the day, even with all this information, there's still a good amount of guesswork here. But it can definitely tell you, for example, if you're earning on the very low end of the spectrum, that, well, you probably could be making more money.